Okay, everybody, it is Thursday, September, September 5th, 2024. And yes, I am here with a predictions and preview for AEW All Out emanating almost two weeks um, after, almost two weeks after All In. All In, of course, was on the 25th of August, which was my, which was my mom's birthday, of course. Some could say, well, it wasn't that last week. Um, to an extent, yes. <laughs> yes, it was last week, um, if you will. But, you know, what are you going to do? Um, essentially, you got you ha- basically the way they had it scheduled out is they did all in, then they had a dynamite and a collision and a rampage after. And then in the go home week, they had a dynamite they're going to have a collision tomorrow night because of all out on uh saturday you know so yeah they kind of scheduled it in a way to where they at least they get two weeks of build or i wouldn't say necessarily two weeks of build but they you know done it in a way to at least they can get like two main shows uh worth of build when it comes to um you know all out and everything with their dynamite and collision uh shows now, with that said, let's talk about some of the matches and where I see some of these uh, going. Now, with these matches, we have eight officially, as of last night on Dynamite, we have eight officially ready to go for All Out. I would expect maybe getting one or two more added in, but I would think those will mostly get added in for the zero hour, just like they were uh, for all, you know, for All In. So I expect maybe a couple matches to be uh, alluded to, if not announced, for the zero hour for All Out come uh, tomorrow night on Collision. Now, with that said, though, you know, who do I see walking out the winners of these matches? Well, we start off, I don't know if this might be the, I don't know if this will be the opener or not. It might be, you know, it might be. But we're looking at Will Ospreay versus Pac. That's P-A-C, Pac, uh, the former Neville in WWE. But Will Ospreay versus Pac for the International Championship. This, if it opens the show, I think would be a smart move because you want to get the fans in Chicago off their feet and just really, you know, excited for what, you know, is to come for the rest of the night. I think these two are going to deliver. The, you're definitely going to see a lot of high flying. There's no doubt. Uh, both are very good at it, and I expect, you know, I expect that not only will Will Osprey win, but he'll win by countering uh, either the Black Arrow, once known as the Red Arrow, you know, when he was in WWE, but the Black Arrow, his twisting, uh, his, twi- his corkscrew, his corkscrew shooting star press. Uh, I see, uh, I see Osprey countering that, and by, by getting the knees up, and then using the uh, sling, uh, using the, um, I guess they could say the blind side, if you will, or the Osprey cutter, you know, as he calls it, uh, to win the match. But it's definitely going to be a show stealer, probably a candidate for match of the night if you're into that. And I do believe they may open the show with Osprey and Pac. You know, I to me that would be the smart move to do, to you know to you know to get the people off their feet. Now, next match. This is kind of a random tag team title match, but it's going to be the Young Bucks, uh, Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, uh, taking on uh, the BCC of Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Yuta. Um, this is just something that is, I guess, thrown on there because, you know, the Bucks, you know, they're playing into the fact that, you know, legitimately they have these limited dates, you know, that they can um, participate in throughout the duration of the new restructured contract. So obviously part of that deal is they got to at least defend the titles uh, within the span of 30 days or at least they got to defend them you know, twice in all that. So, you know, I, I don't know. It's just it's just kind of one of those situations to where it's like, okay, you're defending the titles, but then when are you going to defend them next and all that? But, yeah, the match should be good. 
Um, I do expect I do expect the young bucks to win unless they decide, hey, bucks need to lose because you know they're not always here and everything. And it would be nice to give the BCC some momentum, but uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what they do. Uh, but I'm going to go with the Young Bucks to win, and I think Wheeler Yuta, Wheeler Yuta is in there just to eat the pinfall. Uh, because uh, if you guys have noticed, ever since Claudio, a.k.a. Cesaro in WWE, ever since he's gone to AEW, you know, whether you like Tony Khan or not, he has, in, he has ensured that Claudio doesn't look weak. Like, when he loses, he's not always the one that takes the pinfall at somebody else. So Wheeler Yuta is only there... Uh, to take the pinfall, I think, take the loss. So I do expect, um, I do expect the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson, uh, to retain the AEW World Tag Team titles. Then we have the Chicago Street Fight between Willow Nightingale and you know Chris Statlander with Stokely Hathaway in her corner. Um, it doesn't list it here, but it is from what we understand. It is uh, basically for the CMLL Women's World Championship. That is the other uh, promotion, the rival promotion to AAA in Mexico. It's essentially their Reina's, it is essentially their answer to the AAA Reina de Reina's Championship. Uh, but yeah, it's Willow Nightingale and Chris Stanlander in the Chicago Street Fight. This will be violent, but it will pale in comparison to what happens later. But yeah, it'll be a violent match. You'll see thumbtacks, maybe. You might see some trash cans and all that. It's basically going to be the. Uh, it's basically going to be, you know, a women's death match, maybe almost a women's death match, but basically a hardcore match. And um, I see, I see Willow winning because let's be honest, uh, Tony Khan again giving him a little credit here. He doesn't allow. He doesn't put other companies' championships on the line unless it's without their consent, and them having the final say on who goes over. So I'm sure they're not going to want Willow to lose their championship to another fellow AEW wrestler on an AEW pay per view. So I'm a, I'm going to go with Willow, and I think this might be building towards the end of Statlander and Stokely, because I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling uh, Tony Khan might be on the verge of turning Statlander face again, and it's going to start with her realizing that Stokely probably isn't the best idea to have around, and maybe maybe he was lying to her the entire time. We'll have to see. But I'm going to go with Willow Nightingale uh, to win. Then we have uh, we have let's see we have Cosisto we have. We have Okada. I'm just gonna. I can't really pronounce his name. I always, I always have a hard time pronouncing Kazuchiko Okada. But I'm just gonna call him call it, uh, Okada. He's gonna defend in a fatal four way um, his Continental Championship, uh, and the spots will be determined on collision. There's gonna be three by three matches. So you're gonna have Orange Cassidy against Brian Keith, Lance Archer against Mark Briscoe, and Takeshita versus the Beast Mortos. Excuse me. And I think, honestly, we know who's going to win. It's going to be Cassidy, it's going to be Archer, and it's going to be Takeshita. And that's what I think it's going to be. Because Okada's a heel, so you need to even it out to where it's like, okay, Takeshita is still looked at as... Well, Takeshita is still a heel. Archer is a, a likable heel. Basically, he's a badass heel, a killing machine. So, yeah, I'm going to go... I'm going to go with Cassidy, Archer, and Takeshita. But then again, I wouldn't rule out Mark Briscoe. He is the Ring of Honor World Champion. But I'm probably going to go with Archer, Cassidy, and Takeshita to be in there. But again, they might slot Mark Briscoe in, so we'll see. If they do, that would be great too. Uh, that way you even it out, two heels, two faces. Because like I said, Takeshita still looked at as a heel internally, not a baby face. So, you know, we'll have to see. We'll see what they do. But, you know, but I, I think we, either way, it's going to be a good match. And I think, honestly, Okada in this kind of a match is going to retain because he will be uh, protected. If they do give it to somebody, you know, out of, the, out of these names, 
then I would say they give it to Cassidy. They might give it to Cassidy. Uh, they might give it to uh, they might give it to Takeshita. You know that might be something. Heck, they might even give it to Lance Archer or Mark Briscoe. You know if they if one of them uh, is part is part of this, I would say they would give it to Lance Archer if Mark if he's in there more than likely. But overall, I'm gonna go with Okada to win. I am. Then we have MJF and Daniel Garcia in a singles match, a <laughs> very, well, I'm going to consider being a very violent singles match, um, if you will, the way they're playing it off. So we don't know what the contractional status of Garcia is. It does feel like he has resigned and he's signed a massive contract, which is, I guess, according to reports, if you believe them, has gotten under the skin of people at WWE that do those kind of things. Or are in charge of those kind of, um, I guess you could say, departments and, you know, business uh, contractions and stuff. Um, but, yeah, you know, this has been building for a while. And it, I think, it, it, I think honestly, it'll be a good singles match. It'll be violent, believe it or not. It might, you know, it might get violent um, in a way, but we'll see. It might be one of those things that basically, you know, you know, basically, it'll get violent post-match, if anything. But who do I see winning? Well, obviously, all signs point to MJF. All signs point to MJF if Garcia's contractual status has not changed. Although a lot of signs point to it has and him staying. Especially the way he uh, did that promo last night on MJF. You know, so, you know, so obviously, you know, so obviously, you know, the... All, all signs, I'm trying to find the right word to say, all point to MJF if, again, Garcia is not in the contract, although all signs point to the fact that he is. It's early too, guys. I do apologize. I just woke up a little while ago. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna, honestly, I'm going to go with the safe bet. I'm going to go with MJF. But I do expect maybe... This might be the one match that gives you an upset. That'll basically it'll basically be like if you have a betting pool. If you have a betting pool and everything, this match would be the one that upsets all those betting pools. Basically, it'll be the kind of match to where everybody will bet on and you know bet on and check off MGF to win. And when Garcia wins, it messes everything up. You know, so I'm gonna go. I'm going to go with MJF as a safe bet, but I would not be surprised if they pull out an upset here with Garcia to prolong, you know, the feud and everything to go into, I would assume, Wrestle Dream, if not Grand Slam, in a couple, in about a few weeks. So I'm going to go with MJF, but I'm not going to be surprised if Garcia uh, upsets him. And then that's when we would get that post-match violence uh, occurring, uh, courtesy of MJF, uh, in my opinion. Now, what's up? What's up next? Well, Mercedes Monet versus Hokaru Shida, Hokaru Shida for the TBS Championship. It was announced last night that Camille, the former NWA Women's World Champion, one of the longest in the modern era, uh, former bodyguard for Nick Aldis when he was champion, uh, she will be banned from ringside. Now, What's interesting is if you look at the motions, you know, from, you know, from the reactions by Mercedes and Camille, and I think what they probably, I didn't see what they said afterwards, you know, after the show in the YouTube exclusive, but it sounds like Mercedes is going to do what she can to overrule this. Like she's going to call lawyers or something like that. And I would not be surprised if tomorrow night on Collision, she shows up, you know, she shows up with Camille, hands Daniels a piece of paper stating that. Legally, Camille has to be at ringside, so there's nothing he can really do, or else they'll be sued. So I could see that. I could see that, you know, being the case. But I can also see maybe something happening that if that does occur, Daniels is like, okay, fine. Okay, I can't do anything about that. But, you know, if you don't want pe but, but if you don't want people to think you can't win the match on your own, don't have her interfere. Prove me wrong. Or, or whatever. You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what they'll do. I don't know what to do. But, uh, but yeah, right now, storyline wise for the match, Camille is banned from ringside. But again, the way the motions that they were having in the ring and afterwards, 
Something tells me they're gonna try, Mercedes is going to try to override this and get Camille at ringside, um, if you will. And I think Daniels might counteract that by saying, okay, she can remain, but if she interferes once, you know, if she interferes once or it's indicated she has, then I or Aubrey Edwards, who could be the referee there, will toss them out. She will be tossed out. Even if, you know, even if it doesn't look like she's done anything, but it looks like she has, she's out. You know, she's out and everything. So, so yeah, I think that might be some kind of a deal worked out to where, okay, she can stay at ringside, but if the referee, you know, turns around and sees something happen to her, her you know, something happens to her, her career, uh, to Sheeta, if you will, can't, can't speak right now. Like I said, it's early. If something has happened to Sheeta without you doing anything, then they have the power to toss Camille out. Because all evidence would point to her. So I could see, you know, Mercedes getting this overridden. But like I said, working out a, a deal to where Camille cannot interfere. Because if there's even a sign that she may have done something, you know, she's gone. Even if the referee doesn't see it. But the match ought to be good. The match ought to be good. Um, all signs are pointing to Monet winning and retaining. And I totally believe that. But I would not be surprised if they decide to give it to Sheeta. And the reason I say that is we haven't seen Britt since All Out. What better way to make her come back after that loss and stick it to Mercedes than to cost Mercedes the TBS title? You know, I'm just saying. You know, I'm just saying. You know, so all signs point to Mercedes winning and retaining, which I'm all in for, you know, the coin of phrase. But I would not be surprised, again, like with Garcia and MGF, if they give it to, you know, Sheeta, but do it in a manner to where, because maybe Camille's not there, it allows Brett to show up and cost, you know, uh, Mercedes the match and the title. But here's the thing. I don't think Mercedes will, you know, be without the TBS title for long. And you know why? Because she would have a contractual rematch and I would see her getting it back at Grand Slam, and then that way you set up to maybe another match between her and Britt, or maybe a match between her and Jamie Hayter. We'll have to see. But all signs point to Mercedes. Again, I would not be surprised if they get to Sheeta because of maybe Britt's return uh, down the line. I would not be surprised by that. Okay, next up, we have Brian Danielson a.k.a. Daniel Bryan, defending his newly won AEW World Championship against Jack Perry, the scapegoat, the TNT champion. Uh, this match was made because Danielson uh, last Tuesday, or not last Tuesday, but last Wednesday, came out, said it's time for him to go, it's, it's time for him to step away, but not just, you know, but not so, but not just yet. And he's basically... He's basically go basically what he did is he you know he took a page out of the Ric Flair as a WWE Ric Flair uh, playbook you know from about what 2000 what was it 2008 I think and he basically told uh, the world that whoever beats him for this championship that's the night he hang that's the night his days as a full time competitor you know if not an overall in ring competitor are over. So, excuse me. So I could see, you know, so I could see that being, you know, something that they build towards to, you know, maybe wrestle dream in Tacoma. That's what I'm thinking. They could prolong it, you know, a little longer and go to World's End because it would fit in perfectly with that. You know, World's End, career's over, you know, and so on. But. You know, obviously, they might want to do it in Tacoma because, you know, that's where he's from, or at least, you know, that's the state he's from, so we'll see. But, but yeah, Jack Perry, uh, brought in, obviously, Jack Perry is being brought in because of, you know, his history with Chicago, him basically being the one responsible, you know, for CM Punk being fired and everything. You know, in the heat, he might, the heat he may generate. Although the last time he was in Chicago for New Japan Pro Wrestling, he actually got a decent reaction, kind of a, a mixed reaction. Some would say it was more cheers than boos and stuff like that. But, you know, 
But, you know, here's the thing. He's not going in there as part of New Japan this time around. He's going in there as part of AEW, the company that CM Punk was part of. So it's more than likely he'll get booed. Uh, but the match ought to be good. Um, we heard that the Bucks said that they will do whatever they can to get the AEW, back where, AEW World Championship back home where it belongs with them. Uh, I think basically there, you kind of played your cards too soon. And I do expect Danielson to win. Now, here's the interesting part. We still have Christian Cage with that guaranteed championship contract that he could basically, I guess you could say, you know, um, activate at any time. You know, activate at any time. So he could play, you know, he could play a role in this. But whatever the situation is, I expect Danielson to retain and walk out the AEW World Champion. Whether it's, you know, just one-on-one -on -one with Jack Perry or if Christian tries to play a, you know, spoiler and insert himself into the match or even tries to uh, activate his his uh, title shot after the match and take advantage, I could see I could see no other option than, you know, Danielson walking out as champion and maybe his final match being in Tacoma for Wrestle Dream. That's just my opinion. But all sides to me will point towards Danielson uh, retaining, you know, his championship. Now, with that said, let's get on to what is going to be basically all reports have pretty much confirmed this from the eternal, from the eternal, I, I guess you could say, from the, in, from the intel, internal um, people that work for AEW that book the stuff. It has been confirmed that Hangman Adam Page, Swerve Strictly, inside a steel cage will be the main event. And after the ending of, and after what we saw at the ending of last night, you know, because, you know, let's be honest. AEW, you know, did this thing yesterday where they posted on the YouTube channel, on the social media, that Swerve was using the money he now had to buy back his childhood home that he grew up on, or grew up in. And they did a masterful job of showing that and everything. Uh, you could tell that that's legitimate, that was real, that was a shoot. But, <laughs> excuse me, but I don't think anybody expected them to really incorporate it into the Hangman Swerve storyline like they did last night. I mean, people, people, people had an idea, maybe like, okay, why is AEW doing this today? It, it seems kind of weird, or uh, not weird, but it seems kind of, uh, Ironic that they're doing it on the day of Dynamite, the Dynamite before All Out. You know, so a lot of people kind of had an idea like, is this, you know, is this going to play a part in what happens tonight? And sure enough, it did. Now, now I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to tell you this right now. They did not, they did not burn down Swerve's actual childhood home. Let, let's be honest. They did not burn down the actual house he bought that his family lived in for years. What they did is they found a house uh, very similar, very similar uh, to the other one um, that was probably going to get torn down or they paid money, okay, more than likely, I should say, they probably paid some money to have a house constructed, or constructed, I should say, <laughs> uh, to look similar inter internal, uh, um, um, outside and inside-wise you know, and everything. I'm trying to find the right word to say there. Interior, that's right. Interior-wise and outside wise and outerior. So basically make, you know, have a house that was, you know, build a house that was similar interior and outerior. So, you know, that's more than likely uh, what I think they did instead of just finding an abandoned house that looked similar. So I think, you know, more than likely they had someone, they contracted someone to, uh, contracted someone to uh, build a house, you know, real quickly. Well, I wouldn't say real quickly, but just, you know, enough to where it would easily go up in flames and stuff that would match what Swerve's childhood house looked like from the outside and inside. Because when you really look at when the house was, when Hangman started to burn the house, it went up too easily, guys. It went up way too easily. So to me, so to me, that was not the real house. They just had one that was built you know, they just had one that was built uh, to make it to, you know, to look like it from the inside and outside. And they probably filmed that moment. They probably filmed, you know, Hangman doing that maybe days before, 
you know, so that way, you know, people can actually get a, um, an actual look at the real house and everything. So, you know, give them props, give them props and everything. They probably filmed when Swerve bought the house for real and then probably took the time going with him, you know, looking on the inside and everything, taking pictures, getting a good idea, getting a good idea of, you know, what the house looks like on the inside and the outside. I know I'm saying that a lot, I do apologize, but then building it to, you know, those specifications so it can get burned down. Because let's be honest, let's be honest, Tony Khan is not about to let, you know, somebody's childhood home that they bought with the money he's paying them with the contract he's given Swerve, whether you're WWE and you agree with that or not. He's not about to let that happen. So, you know, give him props, give him props on that. But as a result, Tony Khan um, off air came out and announced some added stipulations to the cage match between Swerve and Hangman. And it just added stipulations is it's unsanctioned lights out. And what that means in case somebody don't, in case some people don't know is essentially, uh, essentially, basically, I'm trying to find the right words to say, essentially, basically, um, there are no rules, obviously, you know, especially within a cage. You, well, within a cage match, the only rules are pin or escape, pin, submission, or escape, and that's it. But here it's, you know, but here you add in unsanctioned and lights out. It means you could do anything. And most, and most importantly, AEW is not responsible for anything that occurs in that match. You know, if Hangman wants to use a barbed wire rope to try to choke Swerve, he'll use, uh, you know, to try to choke him out in his career, AEW is not responsible. You know, if Swerve decides to do the same in turn to Hangman, no one's responsible. You know, not AEW is not responsible. And what they do is they announce it's unsanctioned. They announce it's lights out. And what they do is they close the light. They turn the lights down, then they turn them back on. Because what that means, what that means, and I know some people might think it's ridiculous. What that means is when the lights go out, then the AEW sanction portion of the event is done. And now the unsanctioned portion will be, you know, will begin, basically will be its own thing. You know, that's what they mean by lights out. Basically, it's like, the light, it's, you know, it's essentially like when they close the lights when the show is officially over. You know, that's what it is. It's unsanctioned, nothing to do with AEW, and the lights going out mean, uh, meaning basically, yeah, this match is not, you know, we're not sanctioning this, or you have nothing to do with this, this is not part of AEW, these two just want to kill each other. Or fight, or basically beat each other to a bloody pulp, if you will. So what that ensures is not only will this match be the main event, but it will be violent. It'll be probably one of the most violent cage matches. Um, I would say since what the Lucha Bros and the Young Bucks at what at All Out or Full Gear a couple of years ago for the tag titles, it'll be that violent. If not, will surpass it. Because we saw what they did in the Texas Death Match last year. You know, the question is, how do you top it? How about, I don't know, you go unsanctioned. And you go lights out. And you add in the confines of a cage. I'm just, excuse me, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And what's interesting, too, is I don't know if they'll, you know, utilize a regular cage. Or well, they might use one of those um, enclosed cage, kind of like very Thunderdome-like and all that. Or kind of like what they did. Or kind of like what WCW once did um, in uh, for Halloween Havoc or something like that. It's just like a big old cage that surrounds the ring and everything. I don't know if they'll do that. Because if they go that route, if they go like, okay, here's the steel cage, but it's a cage that's going to surround the ring... Not a hell in the cell, but just like a regular case that surrounds the ring. To me, that could give them more leeway to do whatever the hell they want. But they could do anything they want, you know, even with a regular cage in an unsanctioned lights out. So whatever happens, it happens. But yeah, the question is, who comes out on top? Well, this is a toss up. Because do you keep Hangman going down the deranged psychopath? Or 
Do you give him a little bit of rectification and help it and allow him to get that win that he's needed over Swerve? And then maybe afterwards you have either on Dynamite following All Out or whatever, you have Swerve not only congratulate him for beating him, but then maybe reveal something to him that he doesn't know. And I've always been thinking like, okay, why did Swerve have to break into his house the way he did? Why did he have to go that far? And why did he kind of do that similarly? I wouldn't say break into the house, but go the family route, you know, with Danielson. Like, what's going on? And I could see Swerve uh, win or lose and acknowledge to Paige that the reason he did this to him and the reason he kind of did it with Danielson is because he knows that they're the only ones in AEW that in a fair fight can straight up beat him. And that the last thing he needs is to have to continuously wait his turn because he's sick and tired of waiting. You know, so I could see him admit to that in the post uh, in the uh, post all out edition of Dynamite. I could see him doing that as well as even acknowledge something that, again, uh, Hangman may not know of. And then I think what will happen is he'll toss it to the Titan Tron or the AEW Tron, the Elite Tron, if you will, and show some security footage or hidden camera footage of him making a deal or being paid off by the Bucks. And that the Bucks are the reason he did what he did uh, to Hangman sneaking into his house because the Bucks wanted to uh, basically um, mentally get to Hangman so they can make it so it can make it easier for them to manipulate and control him and bring him back to their side. You know, I and, and I know you might think that sounds ridiculous, but I just I just can't get that out of my I just can't get that out of my head that that is something that is something that I could see happening because let's be honest, you know, you know in AEW, you know in AEW, you know Hangman. You know, he's made it clear. He's made it clear in storyline and all that. You know, he wants nothing to do. He wants nothing to do with the with the Bucks anymore, especially now in this whole elite, you know, EVP stat, uh, personas that they're doing. He wants nothing to really do with them. So, you know, so to me, that could be something that, you know, you need the Bucks to have a storyline. You know, you need something that's going to probably end this storyline before you begin this whole new Moxley, Marina Shafir, possibly Shane McMahon and whoever else storyline. So, you know, so why not, you know, why not get, you know, why not have, you know, someone that is, cl that, you know, was once close to them, you know, along with his sworn adversary enemy, you know, kind of take them down. You know, to me, it makes sense. To me, it makes sense and everything. But again, that's just something that I thought of. Now, could they do that? We'll have to see, but it will. It, it'll. It to me, it would definitely give both men, you know, something to do afterwards together, joining forces reluctantly, to you know get at the people that were really responsible. That's again just my opinion. But who do I see winning? It's a toss up, because again, you have Swerve win. It just you know drives you know you keep having Hangman go into that insane asylum of madness and everything. Uh, to the point that, you know, you might have to go back to that original plan uh, that they did back in August of 2020, uh, last year, actually, believe it or not, uh, because of the whole uh, the whole thing of Punk and, you know, his friend, you know, Punk, you know, and, and his crew and, you know, the Bucks and their crew not being able to be, like, on the same page or the same show. Um, you know, you could go down that path in storyline, and finally give Collision a reason for living and maybe tie it in with the whole possible Shane McMahon deal and have Hangman or Sura be, you know, the face of Collision while the other is the face of Dynamite. I mean, I, I mean, here's the thing. You have people like JD, JD from NY206 of Off the Script, you know, throwing out the idea that after Bad Blood, Hell in the Cell, you know, possible Loser Leaves Raw match, you, that you cannot have... You know, McIntyre and Punk on the same show after all of that. You can't. You need to have them separate. So send one of them, mostly McIntyre, to SmackDown and give Cody a fresh opponent to feud with. So, you know, so I could see maybe AEW, you know, doing something similar. Like, okay, after all said and done, 
you know, obviously these two can't be on the same, you know, the same show and everything, you know, because if they don't go the route that I was mentioning that I thought about, I could see him going that route where one has to be on another show, one has to be on the other show. I could see him doing that. I can't. So, you know, so to me, so to me, do you, again, do you go with Swerve, you know, continuously proving that he's better than Hangman? Or do you give Hangman that win finally? We'll have to see. So to me, the main event's a toss-up. It is a toss-up, so it could go either way. But the outcome I see, the aftermath I see, honestly, is either these two rec- these two kind of slowly uh, reconcile and then the truth comes out that the Bucks were the ones behind Swerve doing what he did at Hangman's house. You know, you know, either you know that that gets revealed and it brings them together to finally put an end to the bugs, put an end to the elite, and just end that storyline entirely before you do the Moxley, Marina, Shafir, Shane thing, whatever. Um, you know, I, I could see them doing that, or if not, I could see maybe Shane coming in as a co-owner, but acknowledging, hey, you got two people here in a sort of a hangman, they can't be on the same show, so why not we? Split, you know, so why not we put them on different shows as well as split the roster evenly so everybody gets an opportunity and give each show a championship? You know, that could be what happens too, and that might be what is the catalyst. This might be the catalyst for that happening. We'll have to see. But to me, it's a toss up. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Uh, but anyway, though, guys, those are just my AEW predictions, uh, my AEW All Out uh, 2024 preview and predictions. Let me know if you agree or not. Comment below. Like the video. Uh, click that bell for notification. Also, subscribe to the channel, guys. It would help me out tremendously if you did that and everything. It would help me out tremendously. Like I said, click that bell, bell for notification. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video. Also, check out my Teespring store for merchandise you can't get anywhere else. Get yourself a sweater in time for the fall, a t shirt, a mug, a mouse pad, uh, a phone case. All are there um, at my Teespring store. Link will be in the description, as well as links to where you can find me elsewhere on the internet from odyssey.com to rumble.com to Vimo to Spotify for podcasters, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, iTunes, you name it. Um, and also, I have a Venmo and a Cash App if you want to help out there. It'd be greatly appreciated. But, guys, let me know what your thoughts are on my, pre- on my predictions for All Out. Do you agree with them? Let me know what yours are, and until then, I'm out.